As you know, the word woke can mean many things, and we're taking it back. Um, we are talking about waking up spiritually. We are talking about um, going from a state of spiritual sleep to a state of spiritual awake, where you are growing, where you're changing. And a psychologist who I read here recently said that one of the most toxic traits or indications in any relationship is when you decide that a person cannot change, that you, when you decide that a person cannot change. And I want us to think about that for a second. First of all, God is a God who is all about change and you can change. The people around you can change. And it's what keeps me doing what I do here every single Sunday is believing that the Holy Spirit of God, when he indwells the life of a believer like you and I, that he changes us from the inside out. And that our past, that our excuses, that our limitations, that the things that we have often said to God were reasons that he couldn't use us or wouldn't use us, those things don't count. They don't matter. That God is about change and he's growing something in us that looks like Jesus. I want to try to help you see that today because we're starting a, a new series on spiritual growth, spiritual disciplines. There's no real great way to say it. Discipline doesn't sound fun, but discipline is simply doing something today that you may or may not want to do so that you can get a result tomorrow or next week or next year that you really want to get. And we know that discipline happens in many forms. You can have physical discipline, you can have spiritual discipline, you can have emotional and relational discipline. And sometimes we separate or segregate our lives, our spiritual lives from the rest of our lives. And I think sometimes we say, well, my financial discipline's on point, but I think, you know, my physical discipline and, and my uh, you know, spiritual discipline needs a little work. And I believe that God looks at our lives as one particular unit, and he's not just interested in our spiritual lives, he's interested in your entire life. And so a person who's disciplined in one area usually is disciplined in others. And the transformation process takes a person like me and you, who when we start, we're not like Jesus at all, and then over time, he begins to do something in us that's miraculous. We soften, we become wise. We start to see the world from God's perspective, not our perspective. We start investing in the lives of the people who are around us. And instead of thinking about what it is we're gonna get from this Christianity thing, we start thinking about what it is we can give. And then if we're not careful, we look back and we say, I'm growing. And the cool thing about growth is it's nothing we do in ourselves or for ourselves. It's something the Holy Spirit does in us if we put ourselves in the right place. Does that sound mysterious? I'm gonna to try to explain it to you. The Apostle Paul explains it to us in Romans 12. And this is one of my favorite passages of scripture. I usually get accused of saying, well, pastor, you said this was your favorite passage. I think whatever I'm preaching is my current favorite passage because I get so excited about it. I just wanna share it with you. But this is one that we've talked about two different times in some detail. And today we're gonna to really dive a little deeper at about a different part or aspect of this passage, but it's pivotal. The Apostle Paul, for those of you who don't know, wasn't always the Apostle Paul. His name used to be Saul. He was a killer of Christians. He was one of the most prolific sinners on the face of the earth. He was a legalist. He was a hypocrite. He hated Jesus and everything Jesus stood for. And his job was to eradicate any thought, Christian thought, Christ-likeness, dedication to Christ from the entire earth. And then miraculously, God literally knocked him off his horse, blinded him with a light, he was changed. He became a believer and the Holy Spirit of God came into his life just like the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and begins to change us from the inside out. And Paul went from a murderous, legalistic, hypocritical, um, religious bigot to one of the most soft-hearted and compassionate yet bold pastors and missionaries that history has ever given us. And he wrote this book through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this letter to the church in Rome. And the Apostle Paul had a pattern when he taught. And the pattern was this. He always gave doctrine, then he gave duty. He gave doctrine, then he gave duty. Doctrine and duty. This is what you do based on what you know. So this is what you should know. Now let's go ahead and do it. Does that make sense? Knowing it's not enough, knowing it and doing it. So he spent the first 11 chapters of Romans 12 talking about doctrine, truths. He calls them mercies in Romans 12, 1. 
These mercies that he talked about are salvation from God. They are the love of God. They are peace that comes from God, the gift of the Holy Spirit, a patience that is God given, the ability to forgive as we've been forgiven. And then in, in chapter 12, he turns the page and he says, okay, I have taken 11 chapters. It'll only take you a couple hours to read if you're really digging in to tell you what it is you need to know. Now let me share with you how you can begin to live so that you can be changed too. Because one of the most toxic things we can believe, one of the most toxic traits that we can believe about another person or ourselves is that we cannot change because God is in the change business. So look with me at Romans 12, one through three. Um, are you ready? Okay, uh, you, you think you're ready. I think you're probably, you look pretty ready. Um, you guys online, they look ready. Um, it's a little, gonna be a little bit more technical today than, than sometimes. I'm gonna teach you a little bit more about this passage and the way it works together because it's going to be the foundation for the next six weeks that we spend together. And each of the next six weeks, we're going to be talking about a thing you can do or should do that's a simple thing that you put in your life. And if you do it over time, it is going to change you in ways that make your old self hard to recognize. But this is the foundation. This is me convincing you. Not only that it can happen, but it should happen, that it will happen. And the apostle Paul, it's his words, not mine. His words came from the Holy Spirit of God, who is God. So God's telling you this. I'm just trying to stand here and help you understand it. So let's start together. Therefore, I urge you. Now, right off the bat, Paul says he urges. The word urge, pericle, it means like an attorney who you hire, who comes alongside and his job or her job is to work in your best interest. They come alongside, they put their arm around you and they say, listen, I am for you and I am not leaving and I am here, but this is what you need to do. And they all but drag you toward doing the right kind of thing, the right decision. So he says, I'm your brother, but I'm also spiritually the one who's here explaining this to you. Come with me, I urge you. Brothers and sisters, assuming that the people he's talking to are already believers. Now, Paul, in other sections of his writings, talks about life. And he says, we're all dead in our transgressions and sins. And so um, when a person's dead, then visually, you know, when a person's dead, then they're dead, right? They're totally dead. They're dead. You poke them with a stick. They're dead. You talk to them. They don't move. They're dead. They're dead in their transgressions and their sins. Now, he says they're made alive in Christ, that the Holy Spirit of God whispers in the ear of a person who's spiritually dead and extends the invitation for salvation. And so a person based on their own free will and choice chooses to receive salvation and then is made alive, given a new life. But just because we've been given a new nature and a new life and gone from death to life, from darkness to light, from old to new, doesn't mean there's not work to do. The moment that we are Christian, that we become a follower of Christ, it doesn't mean that we're mature. It doesn't mean we look like Jesus. It just means that we're getting started. That if we were to die, our salvation is secured in heaven. We're going to go be with Jesus, but there are things for us to do. There's a person for us to become. And so Jesus takes us by the hand and, and the process, it's called sanctification. If you go to seminary or listen to pastors who like to confuse you with big words, it's called sanctification. But what it really means is it's the process of helping you become like Jesus. And so as you live with each day, with each step you take, you're becoming more like Jesus if we are allowing him to do that work in us. So Paul, the apostle Paul is assuming the people who are reading this are trying to apply this are in this process, that they've become believers of Jesus, that they are Christian. So I'm assuming that now for the purpose of explaining to you what can happen only if you're a follower of Christ. If you're not, we talk about how to become a follower of Christ all the time. And I want nothing more than to explain that to you. So grab me after church or one of our pastors. We'd love to talk with you about that. The apostle Paul says, I urge you fellow brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy, and you may say, because we all have short attention spans and memories, what are God's mercies? And I would say, I told you just a minute ago, remember he wrote in chapters one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 and 11 of Romans, which you haven't read yet, but you might, what all the mercies are. Salvation, how much God loves us, the peace that he gives us, the hope, the grace, the forgiveness, the ability to forgive. 
And he says, I urge you because of all of the things that Jesus has done for you and all that he's given you, offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now, it's an Old Testament reference to the sacrificial system. You and I, we don't sacrifice animals. And um, thankfully, uh, that system's gone. But that doesn't mean that we still don't offer something to God. Why is Paul preoccupied with the body? Well, the Greeks believed that the body was bad and the spirit was good and they could do whatever they wanted to do. And they could suffer no repercussions from it. They could be addicted. They could be sexually promiscuous or perverted. They could, uh, I mean, anything the body wants to do. It's like the body's bad, so just let it do what it wants. But the spirit is good, so we need to preserve the inner person. And some early Christians were, were struggling with this. Paul was concerned with the body because the body really is the case. It is the, the um, container that holds the soul, that holds the will. It houses the way that we show our whole person is committed to the Lord. Our body is also what it is that we sin with when we choose to sin. It's what it is that, or what allows us to show up when we choose to show up. And so he's very preoccupied with this idea of presenting our bodies because the body is the beginning. I tell you many times, 90% is showing up here at church on Sunday mornings, right? 90% of success is tuning in. And you look at me like, yeah, whatever, whatever. But the point is that when you put your body in the right spot, what follows? Your heart begins to follow. That when you put your body in the right frame of mind, that your heart, your will begins to follow. That when you present your body to things that are not going to make you godly and bring out Christ in you, that your mind and your will begins to follow. And Paul's saying, listen, the body is important because it's your expression of your heart. And it's the container of all things that are important. And yes, he even goes on in other places to talk about how we war with sin that exists within our body. And we know one day when we die, our bodies are left behind and our spirit goes to be with Jesus. And you know, we've talked about the things that happen and after the rapture. And anyway, we don't want to get into that. We reunite with a perfect body. But he says, present your bodies to God. Make a decision that this is who you're going to be. Make a decision that even if you don't want to, you're going to be this person, that you're going to offer it to God, regardless of what's going on in here, what's expressed out here belongs to the Lord. And he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice because we have to do it today. And then we have to do it when we wake up in the morning and then we do it again next week and then we do it again in a month. And unfortunately, I can't just do it one time and just have it be done. It's something that I have to do even multiple times a day. Sometimes the very best thing we can do is say no to our body. No, say it to a dog, you say it to a child, but we don't say it to ourselves. No, or yes. And the question follows why? Because it's who I am. I am presenting my body to Christ because of the mercies that he's given me. And the apostle Paul goes on and he says, it's pleasing to God. It's our true and proper worship that God doesn't just want externals, that he's not just concerned about how many times you may come to a worship service or how many quiet times you may have or what check you write and put in the offering plate. Those things are important and come from a heart that's committed to the Lord, but he's concerned about your heart. And he said, this is the way I want you to worship. I want you to present to me your body, which contains your will, your mind, your heart. It's what demonstrates physically the actions that come from who you are. And everybody's listening going, all right, this sounds right, but it's hard. I was like, yeah, right on. I told you this was, you know, fairly easy to understand, but it doesn't mean that it's always easy to do. And then he goes on and he says, listen, don't conform to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then this stuff's going to make sense to you. Then you're going to understand. You're going to be able to test and approve what God's will is. And you're going to begin to grow. 
Now, there's two concepts here that are important. I've illustrated them in your notes with two opposing arrows. The words conform and transform in Greek, and again, I put the Greek words in your notes, literally explain a situation here that's complicated but significant. When the Apostle Paul says, do not be conformed to the world's plan for you, he says, do not masquerade or put on the mask, the costume of the world. That there are two currents, and this is explained through the passive imperative nature of the compound verbs that are used at the end of this passage, that there's two currents that are, that we are experiencing, one of two, and there's no middle ground. One of them is the current of the world that pulls us towards Satan's plan for our life. The other is the current of the spirit that transforms us into a new person. And the word that he uses for transforms is metamorpho, like a butterfly going into a cocoon as an ugly old caterpillar. And over time, coming out something amazing. But you know, just like a butterfly doesn't will himself into, or a caterpillar to a butterfly, we can't will ourselves into spiritual growth. And so the way he explains this is, is that you have to put yourself in one of these two currents. The conforming current will put the world's stamp on you. That if you present your bodies to the current of the world, that the world will bend you to its will and you'll begin to look just like it. What's more tragic than a Christian who looks and acts just like the world around us? And I'm not talking about trying to look holy and be separate and annoying or obnoxious. But I'm talking about what's more beautiful than a Christian whose heart is getting softer, whose demeanor is more approachable, who forgives quickly, who loves generously, and who serves to point people to Jesus. And Paul says, jump in the current of the spirit, put yourself in that place. And that's an act of the will. It's just like me going up to the dam at Sailorville Lake and jumping in the Des Moines River. Where would I end up? Somebody in the first service said the hospital, um, because it's, you know, that's a germy river. There's lots of suds and I think it comes from pesticides, not from Jesus, but it, that's okay. I'm not a biologist or whatever they are that decide that stuff. Where would you end up downtown, right? The current would sweep you along. It would take you downtown. I wouldn't have to do nothing. Just sit there, feet up, floating in the water. There I am, but I have to stay in that current. I can also put myself in the current of the world, feet up, do nothing, and it's gonna take me the opposite direction and create in me a person who I won't recognize and don't like very much. The Apostle Paul was about doctrine and duty. The doctrine is, the teaching is that there are two currents and you have to choose which one you're going to exist within because there is no safe space on the bank. So by presenting yourself even this morning for an hour here or two hours, if you joined a city group, that's part of this existing within the current of the spirit, the transformation process, carving out some time in your day to install or try out a couple of new habits that won't take much time and aren't complicated, but if done consistently, the Holy Spirit will use them to transform you into a person, the person he has in mind. Knowing is one thing, but experiencing is something totally different. Joy and I went to the gym last week and um, we were exercising, doing bench press and Joy, she got off the bench and she's walking across the gym and she stops right in the middle of the gym and she looks at me and I said, what's, what's going on, sweetheart? And, um, you know, she just stops for a second. It was obviously a crisis going on for her and I wanted to figure out what it was. And she said to me, my hands stink, not mine, hers. And so my response was, you're at the gym, Joy. Everybody knows you don't smell your hands at the gym. Um, you go to the gym, everybody's hands stink. It's just the way it is. And she said, yeah, but my hands stink. 
And um, I didn't know what she wanted me to do about it. I mean, I, I, and she goes, smell them. And I said, I'm not smelling your hands. I won't smell your hands no matter what. I don't care what you say they smell like. If somebody comes up to you and says, smell my hand, don't do it. It's a trick. And, and she goes, but my hands smell. And I said, I understand everybody's hands smell when they go to the gym. It's just the way it is. She goes, that bar must be dirty. And I said, yes, they never clean it. It's very dirty. It's the gym. And then she said, smell your hands. And I said, I'm not smelling my hands. Now, here's the deal. I knew in my head that my hands stunk. I knew it. I didn't have, I mean, I knew, I, I trusted her that it was true. She had the full experience because not only did she know in her head, she stuck her nose in and she experienced it. Now that may be an example of the negative, but let me share with you an example of the positive. Our youth group last week was meeting as they always do on Wednesday evenings. And Bill Rose, one of our deacons meets with our senior high boys and they were talking about the fruit of the spirit. You may not know what the fruit of the spirit are. The fruit of the spirit are characteristics. They're descriptions of this transformation that we go through. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Apostle Paul talks about those too. And Bill wrote these down on the grease board. And the kids that were in there, they asked him to define it. One of them said, what does gentleness mean? So Bill defines gentleness. And apparently they thought for a minute and this young man said, I need, I need that. I need that in my life. So they go off and do their thing. And they come back, Bill comes back and he sees a group of boys standing in there and they're looking at the wall where all of these different characteristics of a person who's being transformed into the image of Jesus, what, what that looks like. And they put their names according to or next to one of these descriptions, each of them choosing a different one, saying this week, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna try to develop this in my life. And at the end of the week, I wanna see this in me. So they got the doctrine and then they embraced the duty. They formed a belief and they stuck their nose in to begin to grow. That's what this series is going to be about. And that's what the apostle Paul says. You're gonna grow one way or the other. You're either gonna become like the world or become like Jesus. So over the next few weeks together, I'll just be giving you each week a simple tool to help us become the person who God intended to become more like Christ. So I think uh, last week, one of the reminders I gave you is um, but what we're talking about is not super complicated. I've tried to say that today. It might sound complicated. I mean, we tried to break down a passage for a second. That's one of the, you know, the more detailed passages that we've covered in a while. And I don't want you to get overwhelmed and feel like it's so complicated that only a spiritual giant could do this or somebody who's, you know, gifted with master's degrees and doctorates in theology. It's just not that complicated. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most simple things that you can do, but it doesn't mean that it's easy. It is right because you've been created by God to live this way. And so what you're trying to do is to line yourself up with the way God has created you. And with God's help, you can become yourself. And so I don't want to overwhelm you and think that you're going to have to add all of these things to your life that are going to complicate your schedule beyond recognition and um, that it's gonna be work because it's, it's not, it's, it's discipline. And, and I wanna share with you just for a second why I believe it's so important for you to be on this journey with me, for us to be on this journey together. The Christian life is not about trying to get everything we can get from God. That's a very basic way to look at Christianity. If we're just looking at God for experiences, for external blessing, for him doing what we want him to do, that's a very immature way to look at God when we begin to grow in our relationship with the Lord, we understand that our spiritual walk is not about getting everything, but it's about being willing to give everything. And when I'm ready to give everything and you're ready to give everything, that's when you begin to get everything, but not before. Are you with me? And these are the things that come. 
not because I'm pursuing these things or demanding them for God, but these are some of the internal personal byproducts that I experience when I begin to live by the Spirit. I can be totally alone with my thoughts, with no people, no distraction, no noise, nothing. Just me, by myself, totally alone. And I can be at peace. I can wake up in the morning and even though I'm not 100% sure what the day is gonna hold, I know that the day that I live, if I'm walking according to, to the spirit, if I'm living this way, I know the day that I live is gonna be purposeful, that it's gonna be significant in some way. You ever have a conversation with somebody and you walk away and you're just like, man, why did I say that? Or replay it a hundred times in your mind and you're like, man, I don't, I'm such an idiot. You know, I don't, I don't know what to say. I got myself in trouble. I mean, that's a common thing for all of us. You can learn to listen to the voice of God, to where he gives you wisdom when you speak so that you can walk away from conversations without regret or rethinking. You'll begin to see the world in a way that may not be comforting, but it makes sense. And it doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes when we're looking through human eyes. You begin to become grounded, secure, unshakable. And it comes through the spirit. These are the mercies that the apostle Paul's talking about. And he said, because God gives all these mercies that you and I need so badly, why wouldn't I carve out some time in my life to put myself in the current of the spirit? We're gonna look at an example real quick as we close. All the way back to the Old Testament. We're not gonna take long. You know this story. It's the story of Moses, one of the uh, patriarchs of our faith. You probably don't even need me to tell you the story of Moses. If you've been with uh, me for the last few years, we've talked about Moses. But if you haven't, uh, you might have seen Charlton Heston play Moses. Wasn't he Moses back in the day? Maybe you saw DreamWorks uh, rendition of Moses. You know Moses, right? Moses, I'm not going to even start when Moses was born in a time when babies were being killed, not when he was put into a basket and put in the river, not when he was rescued by Pharaoh's daughters, not when he was adopted into Pharaoh's home, not when he was raised as a prince of Egypt with all the privilege and, and education and training that he could possibly get. I'm not even going to start when he killed an Egyptian out of anger and, and took off into the desert and ran and ran and ran and ran and ran until he was so exhausted that he stopped and sat down. I'm not even going to start when his soon-to-be stepfather came up and rescued him and found him going, hey, you need a job? And he's like, I don't have a whole lot else to do. Why not? I'm not even going to start when he became a shepherd a Bedouin shepherd, a wanderer with a bunch of scruffy little sheep in the middle of nowhere. I'm going to start about 40 years after that, which makes Moses about 80 years old, which even by those standards was old. No offense to anyone who's 80 or you wouldn't want the life of Moses from 80 on probably at 80 years old. It was a lot, right? It was, but it was right. So here he is. A day like every other day, mundane. Moses may be filling his time as he's walking through the desert with these sheep filled with regret, perhaps thinking of the mistakes he made, maybe the person he could have been, maybe angry with God, maybe not, maybe just angry with himself. Maybe he'd just given up and gotten numb. I don't know. But he's cruising through a day, literally in the middle of nowhere. Well, you can read it with me. He was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him, but he didn't appear as an angel. He appeared in a burning bush. And so Moses, as he was going about his day, doing things that he'd done thousands of times before, all of a sudden this day was unlike any other day and there was a burning bush. So Moses saw this bush and he thought, this is a strange bush, it has not yet burned up. And this is where Moses' story hinges or changes or pivots or turns. How about that? Entire story of Moses on these next few words. Moses said in his mind, I will go over and see what this is all about. 
And because Moses was willing to carve out some time in his day outside of his normal routine, probably in a hurry, even though he didn't need to be in a hurry, taking a step over to this unusual site, he allowed a parenthesis, a cis, cease, a space to meet God. And God spoke to him and said, hey, Moses, do you want a job? And Moses was like, not really. And God said, if you listen to me, I'll do something in you and through you that'll blow your mind. And Moses said, too old, too tired, too many mistakes, can't even speak, can't even think well anymore. Been there, done that, pick a different guy. And God said, Moses, I am who I am. Now, this is Rick's paraphrase. You can read it yourself in Exodus 3. I am who I am, so you don't have to be who you are. You take me by the hand and I will change you into a different person. You can't do it on your own. You can't create in you what it is God wants through you, but you can control your availability. You can move like Moses and turn aside. By being here this morning and tuning in, you've turned aside and created some space. People all over our campus, first service and this service in city groups, small groups, fourth through sixth graders in youth, carving out some time on a Sunday morning, unusual because it's two hours instead of one, carving out a little space, making a decision, many of us, to trust God with the things we can control. What do you mean? Well, it's easy for us to trust God with things we can't control because they're out of our control. But sometimes we create a little space, God's space in our life by choosing to trust him with the things we can control. Like our calendar, like our checkbook. Like where our thoughts dwell. We create a little space by making a decision ahead of time, even though we don't always want to do it, even though it may not be convenient. And we choose to do it because discipline is choosing to do now something we may or may not want to do so that later we can reap the reward of obedience. What I want to help teach you through scripture and follow along with you is how we can move like Moses over the next few weeks. Things you can do to carve out space in your life so that you can see this kind of growth as well. The Apostle Paul describes who you are in Jesus' eyes. And it's a beautiful description and I wanna give this to you because there's one thing you can't escape, my friends, and that is God's love for you. You can escape his purpose for you and you can fight and deny and be at rest with the dis-ease of the soul for years and years and years and years, but you can't deny his love for you. This is what God thinks about you. Let's look together at this passage from the Apostle Paul's writings. First, by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves, because if it was from yourselves, then we would take credit for it. It's from God, he says. It's not that we did anything to work to get this salvation, because if we had to work to get it, we'd have to work to keep it, and we're, we can't do it. We're not good enough, not smart enough. That ship has sailed. We're like Moses, too old, too many mistakes, whatever, can't speak, can't do it. And Paul said, it doesn't matter. You didn't do it. It was by faith you were saved not by works. He says, you know, we boast about it. He says, for you are God's handiwork. This is how he describes you. This is what God thinks about you. You are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance, not to do whatever work you want to do in your life, not to spend your time the way you think you ought to spend it, not to get what you think you deserve or you have coming to you, but to give your time and your life to the Lord and ask him, what are the good works that you have planned for me, planned in advance for me? 
What kind of life is it that I'm supposed to live? What kind of friends am I supposed to have? Am I in the right career? Am I thinking the right thoughts? Am I becoming the right kind of person? What is it you've intended? Because until I line up with what you've intended for me, I'm never going to be myself. And he uses a word here that's so powerful. He says in, in the NIV, it's called handiwork. But what the word is, is poema. Like a poem, it's a masterpiece in progress. And I don't feel like a masterpiece. Maybe you feel like a masterpiece. You do, you're probably in the wrong church. I don't know. I feel like I'm a masterpiece at the very beginning. You ever seen an artist begin to, 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 to paint? Sometimes they'll begin with a sketch and you watch them and it looks bad, right? They're just putting lines on a page. That may be a lot of the time how I feel about it. I'm God's masterpiece at the beginning, just lines on a page, right? And you look at it and you're like, that doesn't look very pretty. And then, you know, the, the artist says, I know, but I'm not done yet. What is it? Give me time. Many times we don't give God time. Now or never, God. My way or the highway, God. Give me time. And over time, as we continue to present ourselves and he paints the picture of our life, it begins to take shape. And it starts looking better. And although it's not there yet, it continues to look more and more and more like a masterpiece so that the time we are done, that he is done, the time we live this life to its full, to the end, where Jesus comes back and gets us or we die and go to be with him. With each stroke of the brush, it looks more like Christ. And that's how God views us. And that's what he does in us. And that's what this series is gonna be all about. You're gonna move like Moses. Now, you have to choose, but let me just offer this thought to you. Christianity is personal, but it's not private. And if you are a husband, a wife, a parent, a father, a mother, a friend, the choices you make influence the people who are around you. And you choose for you, but sometimes you choose for them. So over these next six weeks, let's learn to choose wisely. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I'm so excited to be off in this series, to be started and I just can't wait to see what you do in us individually and as a church, Father. I love my friends. I am so for them and believe in them. But you love them more than I ever could and you believe in them. And you know we live in a world that sets itself up against living for you. But you are greater than the world we live in. That you will give us the desire, the strength and the ability to present our bodies to you as living sacrifices not to be conformed to the image of the world, to, to masquerade and wear the costume of the world around us, but to be transformed like a caterpillar into a butterfly, a new person for your glory to do your will. And I pray, Father, in advance with a thankful heart for what you're going to do in me, in us, and in us as a church. We want you to do it for your glory and yours alone but we're excited and we're looking forward to it. Receive this song as a final thank you to you, God. A final prayer until we meet again next Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen.